Welcome back, everyone, and to the session three of the Book of Jude study. So let let us just jump straight to some recapping from the the previous session. So we looked at verse five to seven, the three past rebellions that were judged by God. One is the Israelites rebelled, then the angels, and then uh, the fleshly people talking about the so Sodom and Gomorrah, and then we look through. Uh, verse 8 to 10, talking about the characteristics of the current rebellion, talking about the false, false teachers in the church. Talk, they, they are dreamers who defile the flesh. They reject authority. Could be talking about earth, earthly authority or angelic authorities. And they slander angels as well. Maybe they were trying to imitate past, past uh, biblical heroes. Verse 9, we looked at Archangel, Archangel Michael, who rebuked the devil, but by using God's authority rather than his own. So not even Michael would slander the devil. And verse 10, the false teachers, their intellectual arrogance and spiritual ignorance are like irrational beasts. That will be their own downfall when God's judgment comes. Tonight, tonight, we will be looking at Jude's condemnation of the false teachers. <clears throat> we will looking, we'll be looking at their patterns of, their patterns of rebellion. The, the, there are six analogies of their ungodliness, some of their ungodly acts in verse 16, and then we'll close with talking about God's coming judgment. So let's jump, jump into it in verse 11 to 16. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to, ba to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds. Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame and wandering stars for whom the gloom of the utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires, they are loud mouth, loud mouth bolsters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Let's commit this. Let's commit this night, uh, this uh, session. Dear Lord Father God, we commit this time of study to you. May you illuminate us with the with your spirit to grasp the message from the book of Jude in this session. In this section, Lord. we thank you and commit all of us to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, woe to them. This is a very typical de declaration of judgment or condemnation. Uh, we see this many times spoken by Jesus himself and also some of the past uh, prophets. Woe to them, typically judging against those who are sinners. Whenever this condemnation is made, there is always a specific reason given why. So here, Jude condemns these false teachers because they follow the patterns of human rebellion. In this one verse, Jude packs three, three Old Testament characters who personified such patterns. There is Cain, and then there's Balaam and Korah. So we start off with the weight of Cain. This is based on Genesis 4. What is he most known for? So just open up to everyone, just you want to type it out in the chat or just open up your, your microphone and just answer quickly. What is Cain most known for? 
murder. He murdered his brother. Yes, that is one. Anything else that you can think of? The Mark of Cain. Mark of Cain, okay. Yeah. There's also jealousy. Someone, uh, Pastor, broke there. Anything else that you can think of? He, uh, he fathered Lamech, Lamech who, had, he fathered. who had seven, was it seven wives or five wives? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lamech and the, the other, and his other wives. He, so let's go through the way of, McCain was most known for, first of all, he gave, he gives inadequate offerings to God. That's the reason why there was this clash between him and Abel. Because Abel was able to, provide a better sacrifice for, for God. For some reason, for some reason, because his offering of uh, vegetables or fruits were, was, not, was not as uh, acceptable to, to Abel's animal sacrifice. Some, some say that this is because Abel's sacrifice required, had the spilling of blood, whereas Cain's did not. It was just fruits and vegetables. But it is more, more, it is more about the attitude of their heart. Abel offered the best to God. Cain did not. It's written right there in, ch in chapter 4, verse 3 to, 3 to 4, that Cain offered some of his harvest, whereas Abel provided his best, the best portion of his, uh, the animal fats and all that. So it's more about the attitude of their hearts. Cain was not really offering adequate, uh, uh, adequate offering because his heart was not in it. Secondly, what he is most known for is being jealous of Abel. He hated him and ended up killing him, murdering him. So what is, his, what is the pattern of rebellion based on Cain? Firstly, it's selfishness. And also there was pride. Now, this, the other pattern that, uh, another pattern is that rebelling against God's way of salvation. But, but this interpretation would require that the idea that the offering is because of the type of offering he was giving, which Cain's did not include uh, blood, the spilling of blood. While it is possible, this interpretation, but it seems unlikely this was what Jude, Jude's point was. The next one is Balaam's error. Now, who here have any, any idea who is Balaam to begin with? Prophet, sent by Prophet. Balak to curse Israel. Yes, that is one, one thing he was most, most known for. Anything else that you can think of that he is most known for? Suppose... He, he he led the Israelites into uh, sexual immorality. Ah, uh, yes, that one is one. The he he advised the king to how to brought them into sin. Uh, Brian here writes supposed to curse but bless instead. Yes, correct. No one mentioned the talking donkey. <laughs> he, uh, Balaam was most known for going to serve an enemy king despite God's very vocal disapproval, which is where the, doc, the talking donkey comes in. Uh, the next one was already mentioned. He was the one that advised King Balak to destroy Israel by corrupting them with sexual immorality. This is found in Numbers uh, chapter 25. We see Moabite women seducing Israelites and leading them to worship other gods. This resulted in God getting angry with them and sending plague against Israel. This was, all, uh, this was all Balaam's idea. So it's quite despicable, this, this fellow. So what is his pattern of rebellion? Firstly, is that he's greedy. He has a love for money. And he, he didn't care that it was at the expense of other people. Other people will get harmed by what he did. So uh, another way to look at it is that using using our spiritual gifts or ministry for material gain, even while harming others. Uh, Peter, was, Peter also mentioned this, that he loved the, the, they loved the wages of wickedness. 
So this was the pattern of Balaam's rebellion. Now Korah's rebellion. Anyone has any idea what this is what this is referring to? Korah. Rebellion against Moses. The ground opened up and eat them. Yes, that's the one. So what what ha what happened here with Korah? Korah rejected the leadership of Moses and Aaron, and he convinced he managed to convince two hundred fifty other leaders to join in their rebe rebellion, and in the end they all got swallowed alive into the earth by the earth. There's a natural phenom phenomenon called soil liquefaction. It's uh, usually an earthquake that somehow causes the earth to literally turn into liquid or quicksand and everything just gets swapped, just gets sucked up into the earth. One happened in Indonesia in September 2018. Many homes and schools got hit and many lives were lost. Some, including many children, were never found, assumed buried alive in the earth. It is a very scary, <laughs> it is a very scary uh, natural disaster. So what is his pattern of rebellion? Rebelling against authority. But more specifically, what Jude is trying to point here is, the, is how they perish that their doom was certain and complete in God's hand. Korah and all his rebellion were all wiped out in that moment. So woe to them, woe to them who follow these three patterns of rebellion. Uh, just an extra note for my, for, for my perspective, because I always thought whenever I saw this, when I, whenever I saw Cain, or Balaam or Korah, I just thought of them as like they're always the bad guys. They're, they're, there's nothing that they did uh, that is good or and nothing interesting about them. They're like the mustache twirling villains in the cartoon. Just bad, always bad, and deserves nothing but bad things to happen to them in return for all the bad things that they did. But reality is often not as simple as that. The mark, of, the mark of Cain, uh, someone mentioned it just now, Mark of Cain was God's special protection over Cain. It's interesting that God still extended his grace on Cain, even after he has murdered Abel. So don't, there are those who think that the Mark of Cain is some kind of curse. It's, it's actually not. Uh, some thought that Cain and all his family were against God and always wicked. But when we study the names in Cain's genealogy and their Hebrew meaning, there are possibly some among his descendants that were worshippers of God. But that, that would be another topic for another day. Balaam was a very unique character in the Old Testament, a prophet of God who was not a Jew or an Israelite. He was a Gentile, a Gentile prophet. And a powerful one, and a powerful one as well. He had constant communication with God, despite God knowing his heart and his thought. And what about Korah? I won't blame you if you thought that Korah and all his family were wiped out, but that did not happen. Actually, some of Korah's descendants were not wiped out. It's, it's written right there in Numbers 26, uh, verse 11. Assumingly, they did not join in the rebellion. In fact, there's a lot of, uh, many of the Psalms that we have states there written by the sons of Korah. So it's really uh, interesting that these characters, they seem like just bad characters, just the bad guys in the Bible, but there's a lot more to their characters. By using by using these three person by using these three characters to personify the patterns of rebellion, Jude was not commenting on their spiritual status, status, the spiritual status of these three characters. But he was writing creatively to deliver his point more effectively. 
So it's important to keep this in mind, the, the creative art of language when it comes to studying the Bible. So let's take, for example, when I say the lust of David, what do you think of from the Old Testament? What do you think of when you think of the lust of David? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. <laughs> you will think of Bathsheba immediately, right? So you will immediately think you can, we can then use this to talk about adultery, the sin of adultery. Because what David did was pretty bad. But it also could refer to the sin, to sin that escalates even further. Because David, David proceeded to kill Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to hide his adultery. So that's an example of how, how this sort of language can help make things a little bit, make things a bit more creative. It makes things interesting for the listeners or readers. And also using fewer words, but still packed with information. And it also gives opportunity for discipling others. Uh, discipling others to take place. If let's say there is a let's say there is a young Christian among us right now who did not understand what was what was this about, he could ask, and someone could take the chance to teach this young Christian. So church, don't be shy to ask to be taught, and also don't be shy to take the chance to disciple others. So let's get back into it. After describing the patterns of rebellion, Jude continues his condemnation of the false teachers by describing their ungodliness by using six very colorful analogies. analogies. The first one is hidden reefs at your love feast. Firstly, what is a love feast? In today's culture, this would be a very questionable name that the corrupt mind most likely would have thought of sex OG or orgies. Come to, think, come to think of it, sex cults were not uncommon in the ancient times as well. But in the context of the early church, love feast refers to the regular, regular partaking, regular gathering to partake in the communion, to, uh, together the bread and cup. Keep in mind, Keep in mind today, when we think of communion, we think of a small piece of bread and a small cup of wine that we partake together. But in the early years, communion was a full meal. Bread and wine were part of their regular diet, like rice is for most of us. In my opinion, it is more similar to say, uh, it is more similar to compare to our say, saying grace before a meal, where we give thanks. So when so we can consider that uh, we can consider love feasts as their time of fellowship while sharing a meal together, or simply put a potluck gathering. An opportunity to, to practice loving and serving one another by sharing meals with one another. So what do you think of calling our church pot bless a uh, love feast next time? So we come to the Quite the, the analogy at hand, what are hidden reefs at the love feast? Hidden reefs refer to reefs or rocks hidden underwater near shores. These are very dangerous because if sailors are not aware, they could get shipwrecked by, by these hidden reefs. So imagine the analogy, hidden rocks in your communion. It's a very strange statement, actually. It doesn't seem to be a matching theme. Uh, sail, sailing and communion. But I guess it could mean that these false teachers, they are like hidden rocks that could wreck your fellowship. It's still a strange analogy. That's, that's because there's another way to translate this phrase. In Greek, the word used here can also be translated as stains or spots. Actually, depending on your, translate, your Bible translation, it would put there as stains or spots or blemishes. 
And I think this translation makes better sense and it matches with what Peter wrote as well, describing the false teachers as blemishes. So these false teachers are stains in your communion. They defile the purpose or meaning of the fellowship. Instead of loving or serving one another, they only love and serve themselves. This follows naturally the second analogy, shepherds feeding themselves. If you are familiar with your Old Testament, you should remember the number of times God was angry against the temple priests or leaders who only cared for themselves and took advantage of their own people. So I propose to you two ways of interpreting this pair of analogies. Firstly, is that there's these false teachers give a false sense of safety, but are fatally dangerous, like hidden reefs that could wreck your fellowship, like bad shepherds who, who are supposed to protect the flock, but they do not. The second one, and it's my preferred one, is that these false teachers defile the church because they are self-serving, simple and straightforward. Let's jump back jump to the next one. The next pair of analogies are also pretty straightforward. First one, waterless clouds, clouds that promise rain, not like the rain that we have currently, but these clouds do not deliver rain. We, we here may not appreciate rain as much, but for a place reliant on agriculture, rain is very important. And so these clouds are no good, only to be blown away by the wind, carried away by the wind. They are useless for the people during that time. <clears throat> the next one, fruitless trees in late autumn. Autumn, autumn is usually uh, harvest time before the winter comes. So trees that still produces no fruit by the end of autumn are essentially useless for farmers. Since they are useless, they might as well be uprooted and used for fire during winter. Hence the phrase twice dead, a tree that's both barren and uprooted, perhaps symbolic of the two deaths, physical and spiritual deaths. I think the interpretation of this pair of analogies is pretty straightforward. These false teachers make false promises that never deliver and therefore they are set to be removed, to be wiped away when the judgment day comes. Let's move on to the next pair of analogies. This pair is a little bit tougher, so let's see. Wild waves of the sea casting up the form of their own shame. This is also another strange analogy. Strange not because not because there's un, unmatching themes, not like the first analogy we looked at, but strange because we don't normally associate foam with shame. Perhaps this, uh, perhaps this illustration could help us better understand this imagery. The beaches we have here are very beautiful but it is such a shame that their beauty is spoiled by all the rubbish that gets washed up by the shore, up the shore. The ocean has a tendency, tendency of exposing the rubbish that hides beneath the, beneath the waves. This is what Jude, this is what Jude means that the waves of the sea cast up the foam of their shame is that the hidden things, the hidden sin is being, is being exposed. Furthermore, wild waves also speak of the lack of peace. In your, in your Bible, you might see a footnote, uh, footnote here on this verse. The footnote would point to Isaiah 57, verse 20, where we, where we have the exact same imagery being used. It says, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Throughout the Bible, waves are often depicted as something negative, 
That's because the C is often associated with chaos or against or being against orderliness. That's why in the beginning, God was hovering over the waters and then he created land out of the waters. God was bringing order into the world, creating a solid foundation for life to thrive in. That's also why in the end, in Revelations, uh, we see in chapter 21 in the book of Revelation, talking about a new heaven and a new earth, we are told there is no longer any sea. There will be no longer any chaos in God's kingdom that is to come. The last analogy is wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Stars have fixed, for, has fixed positions in the sky. And so wandering stars must refer to other objects in the sky that move, such as planets, meteors, or comets, shooting stars. Because of their fixed positions, stars and constellations serve as a reliable guide for travelers and sailors. But stars that move are deceptive and will mislead them. It will be better that they disappear into the night sky rather than misleading the travelers. Looking at, looking at this analogy, it is also interesting that it says wandering stars for whom? These stars are not just objects in the sky. They, they, may, they are referring to people, persons, or living 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 beings so it's easy actually to be reminded of the fallen angels that we read about earlier in verse verse six angels are are referred often as stars in the old testament and the angels who rebel are currently and the the angels that that rebel are currently kept in darkness bound in everlasting chains <clears throat> so these false teachers are similar to these fallen angels. They reject God's authority and they too will be punished. Numerous times Jesus taught about sinners being thrown, being thrown into the outer darkness, a place where there will be weep, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is how I will interpret this pair of analogies. False teachers give no security, no peace, no guidance. And someday their falsehoods will be exposed and they will be punished. So a quick recap of the ungodly characteristics of the false teachers. These false teachers defile the church because they are self-serving. They make false promises that never deliver and they are set to be removed and wiped away when judgment day comes. False teachers, they give no security no peace, no guidance, and they will be exposed and they will be punished. Before we go into verse 14 and 15, we go to verse 16. Here, Jude lists some of the false teachers' ungodly deeds. This list is pretty straightforward, so let's go through it. First, they are grumblers and malcontent. To put it simpler, they are murmurers and complainers. They are never satisfied or content with what they got. Not because the things that not because things can be better for everyone, but because they are greedy for to have more for themselves. This uh, and they and this complaining and grumbling, they can infect other people with that same sense of dissatisfaction. When a Christian becomes dissatisfied with their pastor or church leader, they become more, <clears throat> more susceptible to, to join the false teachers in their rebellion. Just like, the, just like the Israelites in Exodus who kept grumbling and then rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The next one is that they follow their own sinful desires or lustful passions. We already discussed this in the previous session that they follow after their fleshly feelings or instincts. 
they see no issue. They see no issue to claim to be Christians, to be followers of Christ, but still wallowing in their sin. They still live a very, very wicked lifestyle. They are loud mouth boasters. It's, it's bad enough to be boastful about what you have, the, the things that you have. But these guys, they, boast, they are boastful for things that they don't even have. Literally, they are talking hot air. It is very common for false teachers to boast of having special knowledge, special privilege, or special revelation that makes them distinct, special from everyone else. Lastly, they show favoritism to gain advantage. They flatter people with sweet talk while, while actually having a hidden desire, a hidden motive to benefit only themselves. All of this, all of this fit what was said earlier about the patterns of rebellion. Follow, they, they follow the way of Cain. They are selfish and prideful. They commit Balaam's error. They are greedy for personal gain, even if it brings harm to others. Now what's left is the end result of Korah's rebellion. For this, we see, we see Jude quote from Enoch, uh, a prophecy by Enoch. This was taken from the book of Enoch as well. Behold, behold the Lord comes with 10,000s of his holy ones. This phrasing, this phrasing, uh, oh, my note here is a mess for some reason. This phrasing is actually a very, it's not a new phrasing. This, this phrasing has been used a number of times in the Old Testament, like just some examples there, talking about God, God having 10, 10 thousands upon thousands of angels in his command. When, when the Roman soldiers came to arrest him, Jesus also claimed that he could command 12 legions of angels to fight for him. But he didn't because uh, he didn't so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. It is interesting to note that Enoch's prophecy here says holy ones instead of glorious ones, which we saw earlier in verse 8, referring to the fallen angels. So this makes it possible, this makes it possible to refer not only to the angels, but also to saints, to the elect. In the book of Revelation, we see such a scene where Jesus finally returns and he was accompanied by 144,000 saints. That is Revelation 7 and also talked about in verse uh, chapter 14. And what will God and his holy ones be coming to do? To execute judgment. And this prophecy makes it absolutely unambiguous who is getting judged and for what. So let me just, let us just look at how he stresses here. To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the, the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So, <laughs> so all sinners are going to be judged, not only because they are ungodly, no ungodly sinner, no, no ungodly sinners will be spared, but also for all the things that they said or did which are ungodly. And also the and also the ungodly manner that they do that they did them. So it's so it's <laughs> it's really pushing the point, uh, pushing the point through. It seems it seems like overkill, but maybe he actually has a good, he, he actually holds an important truth for us. We know that all sinners say and do ungodly things, but not all sinners are, God, 
un, uh, ungodly because there will be those who have been redeemed through Christ. All will be judged, but only the ungodly are convicted, will be convicted. Church, though we have been redeemed in Christ, it is not uncommon that we still say or do some things that are not godly. Let us not be slow to humble ourselves and repent. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all ungodliness. Church, let us also not be quick to judge one another. For until the day we go to Christ or he returns, we are all still works in progress. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. As we contemplate the glory of our God, we are being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. We all need reminding of the God of the glory of uh, the glory of our Lord. So coming back to Enoch's prophecy, what is Jude's main point here? God is coming to judge all ungodly. So a few questions for us to ponder and discuss. As this is a Bible study, although it sounded like a like a, a sermon for a moment. First question is, how seriously must we work to identify and denounce false teachers? From these few verses, we see how strongly Jude worded his condemnation against false teachers. Their, their self-serving ways are not only defiling the church, but also bringing great harm. The next question is, how confident are you with your Old Testament knowledge? We see how how creative Jude was with his analogies and descriptions and how he weaved many references to the Old Testament. If you did not know your Old Testament, you won't get the full picture of what Jude is trying to say. It's interesting. It's, it's, I, I, as I was doing this, I found it very interesting that Jude is the last book before the book of Revelation because it is like a short tutorial in preparation for John's super deep dive through the scriptures in his, last, in his last letter. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you need to have a firm, grip, a firm grip on the Old Testament. And the last question, I think you probably have an idea what it might be. How have you prepared yourself to contend for the faith. So now I open to everyone to, to answer. You can unmute yourself or you can continue to type in the, in the chat. Uh, Zach, maybe ask this question to you then. I mean, based on the things that you described, uh, is there a risk that we think that we are very good at identifying uh, false teachers because we would think that, you know, uh, people who are greedy, people who do this, people who do that. But then a lot of time, false teachers, they, they are not so obvious, right? Can I say that? Uh, so how, how then can we identify and denounce false teachers from Jude, for example? That's why, that's why in, the, in the first session, we also talked about how it is important to identify false teachers, but it's also important to not be oversensitive without, ju without judging that every disagreement then that means there are false te false teachers or false christians so in in this case in this case when talking about false teachers is talking about the ones that are blatantly uh, false in their teachings not so much the not so much the they are trying to be honest with their interpretation but their interpretation is just way off just dif this differences in interpreting the bible but they are still trying to honor God in their own ways. So this is more like the, what was it? What Paul wrote about the, uh, what Paul wrote about one, one, uh, one faith 
one guy honors God in one way or another. So in this case, uh, we're talking more about those who are really teaching the wrong things. Let's say like, for example, anti, anti-Trinitarians or Mormons, etc. Or those who are more hidden, like the Eastern Lightning Church and the cult and such. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a question of how seriously should we be working on this? I think um, I think it's two things are interesting about Jude. One is, one is as you mentioned in the first study, he was intending to present to them the truths of the gospel, the salvation, but he felt it necessary to instead talk about this. So this was a clearly a, a hot topic that had become a big issue in the churches that he was writing to, um, yeah. such that he felt like he needed to change his plan. And the second thing that's interesting is that it was felt – that this letter should be in the canon of scripture. So even though at one level it was a very specific uh, situation in time, uh, it's also felt, okay, this, is, this, is, this kind of thing is going to be happening frequently enough for this letter to actually be useful to uh, followers of Jesus down through the ages. Mm. Um, yes. so, so I think that's interesting because it shows us that, well, I think, I have two things that I think about it. One is that it, it may not necessarily be happening in our congregation at this time. Uh, but at the other, on the other hand, it is something that happens uh, when the gospel uh, enters into a, into a new society. And when, when churches begin, then there will be uh, people who are uh, demonically influenced to, to lead God's people astray. So, I'm not sure that it's, I don't think that it's uh, something that we should be like making it permanently our, our job to witch hunt anywhere and everywhere. But I do yeah. think it's something that we need to be very alert about. Yes. I find it interesting that uh, what Jude leaves out uh, is also very telling. He did not mention any specific names. Yeah of uh, he didn't identify but he laid down the principles and the patterns for us to recognize i think uh and one of those issues like for example uh you talk about we talked about uh, false teachers or false teaching i think one of the most subtle things is is that teaching coming through uh that becomes self-serving to the person who's teaching it i think you really need to be able to recognize it you know uh, it may not be very evident, for example, when he's, uh, the teacher is preaching or things like that in the, in the public. But what goes behind the scenes after his thought and how, how he uses the gain, let's say if somebody is preaching for tithing okay, or encourage the church to give and do something, all right, uh, giving is a good thing. But then how is that fund being managed? Does he say have full say control of it? He wants to do that, or or is it being managed very independently and transparently and, and accountability, all those things? Uh, so so you you have we will have to match the teaching with the action in that way. So that's that's uh <laughs> I want to follow up on what Pastor Lim was saying because it's not just about money, because I find mm -hmm. sometimes people say that oh he's very humble, he doesn't take a cent and so on. Yeah. Sometimes I find false teachers, uh, they are not lo looking for money. They are looking yeah. for fame. They are looking for influence. They are looking yeah. for uh, followers. So, yeah, they are very generous and humble with their money and so on. They don't take yeah. a single cent and so on. But, but other ways, they are, they are still um, cheating the flock. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are other ways. The, the, the obvious, well, supposed to be obvious is the, the, money, the money issue. There are so many... For so many te uh, Christian teachers who or preachers who are who live extravagant lives behind the scene, having how many private jets to fly here and there, how many big huge mansions that they have, or whatever else that they are doing with the with the money that they receive. That one is the obvious obvious one if we examine 
behind the scene, whereas what Terence is talking about, those who may be looking after other other game, yeah, those ones are the ones that are harder to identify and they they stick around in the congregation a lot longer. Hmm. Well, the, the first thing that struck me was actually when you talk about the hidden reefs, uh, okay? My transla uh, translation, NIV, uh, it put its blemishes or stains, but the hidden reefs really, really uh, uh, struck me because it, it can shipwreck a young believer and even uh, uh, the whole church can go, can split, you see, because of uh, one false teaching or, or somebody, uh, uh, one false teacher. Yeah, I think this is this is particular area. And I thought that hidden reefs, they talk about rocks, right? It's like also I had the initial the impression was that I'm biting a bread, a piece of bread, but when I bite it, it's actually a rock. <laughs> and <laughs> it will break my teeth. Yeah. Uh, that, that kind of things. Yeah. So basically uh, it's dangerous to our faith. Uh, yeah, dangerous to the congregation's health. So these are very subtle things that we have to are uh, they on guard with uh, and even for me i always think about it uh, as uh, we we also have to guard ourselves constantly uh, to make sure my attitudes and, and thoughts and actions uh, 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 do not end up uh, discouraging a brother or sister in christ thank you for that <clears throat> How confident are we with our Old Testament knowledge? I don't know how anybody can say I'm confident because the Old Testament <laughs> is just so wide. <laughs> let, let me throw a spanner into that, uh, to that particular question, Zach, and say, supposing that I didn't know anything about the Old Testament, zero, would I still get the point of what Jude is saying? I think I would. Even yeah. if I had no clue exactly what Korah's rebellion was or who uh, some of these other people were, I think the point of what he's saying uh, comes through loud and clear. So, I mean, I think this this the the main message of his letter should be uh, clear even to uh, people who have never read the Old Testament, yeah. which I'm which I'm thankful for. Yes, that's actually the the wonders of how he how. All, all the biblical writers are in their writing that that even without this background knowledge you can still receive the message of what he's writing about but when we fully understand the ref the 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 background of it the the characters behind it the old testament aspects of it we get a much fuller picture of what they're talking about so yeah, it's not to say not to say that we must have it, but when we have the Old Testament knowledge, we will have a much better, much fuller grasp of uh, all the things that is being talked about mm. or the warning of it. I uh, see but, like watching a movie and then having not watching the last episode and having not watched any of the earlier ones. You can still follow the movie, but you just don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But to be honest, in this case, even if we knew the Old Testament, if we haven't, as I have never read the Apocrypha, there's still quite a lot in this passage that is not very clear to me mm -hmm. because I've never read the writings of Enoch. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, doesn't really make, uh, it doesn't confuse me. I mean, it's still fairly clear. To, even though I don't, may not get every analogy, it's still pretty clear what he's saying. I also have not read up the Apocrypha. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's partly the reason why I think over the years, we have always uh, made sure that uh, we want to cover, I mean, uh, not only just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. So we tend to switch, uh, uh, at least cover one book of the uh, New Testament and one book of the Old Testament uh, in a particular year. So that the, as a congregation, we... Uh, we are exposed to the whole council of God. Yeah. What's the What's the next Old Testament book we are studying? Eh? I think uh, Terence can answer that for us. Next one will be Joel by me. Looking <laughs> <laughs> forward to it. So yeah. uh, before we close, maybe anyone 
uh, have any thoughts on the last question? How have you prepared yourself to contend for the faith? I mean, Zach knows this, but I've been speaking up on Facebook groups. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, for myself, uh, as, as may be apparent from what I've contributed to the WhatsApp group, I, as, as we've been reading Jude, I've been reading Colossians in my uh, personal devotionals. And actually, you know, a lot of what Paul is saying to the Colossians uh, is resonates and similar and and but he's sort of saying that maybe the difference is rather than saying uh contend outwardly he's saying contend inwardly and he's saying you know um don't be don't be deceived by by these these things and set your mind on things above and not things on earth and so um for me my preparation perhaps has been more of an introspective type of thing where i'm just um reflecting on uh, or you know asking the lord how can i set my mind on things above and not on on things uh, worldly things and, and so i guess that's a, the, the other side of the coin is how do we uh yeah how do how do we strengthen our own walk with the lord so that these things don't have any impact on us yes yes actually that is actually that is actually what what ought to be our preparation is more of a inward preparation before we before the the confronting part is actually this so to speak the result the consequence of us being prepared inwardly out uh, personally spiritually and uh, yeah maybe I can also point out that sometimes it's a matter of uh... Uh, understanding our preferences and our leanings. Some people yeah. are much too brash. They go straight into conflict and knock everybody down. They should learn restraint. And uh, some people are more avoid conflict, even though when they see that there's something wrong and they need to learn how to speak up. I think everybody has uh, leanings towards. So just be aware, not saying we have to push to any one side, but just being aware of where we stand, uh, our preferences. Yes. It's good to it's good to understand your personal giftings and and how God has shaped how God has shaped you, then you uh, prepare yourself accordingly, lah. I think I think it's always good to remember that these letters were written to groups of people, and we always read it as individuals. But actually, everything that's written in the epistles is written to uh, groups of people, and so maybe one way that would uh, mitigate our individual um, failings, either being too quick or too slow to confront, is that hopefully uh, this is something that happens corporately, um, that if, if someone is as intimately involved with us to be in our own love feast. I mean, this is, it, I was trying to relate this to, you know, our day where we're looking at things on Facebook and on, on the internet, which people can be millions of you know, thousands, hundreds of miles away from us. We've never met them, we never will. Jude's talking about people who are actually in our most intimate gatherings. And so in that context, I think uh, the, the corporate dimension of resisting false teaching becomes much more significant that, you know, we can talk about these things together and we can say, what do you think about what this person said? And is it something that we should actually do something about or say something about? And then hopefully as we corporately work through these things, you know, it kind of uh, flattens out the, the, whether we're too forward or too slow to kind of hopefully we come to a balanced um, response. Yeah, the, the church is the body of Christ. They are the arms, the legs, the eyes, the mouth, the hands, the shoulder. So each of us are gifted differently and we, are, we operate differently. But all of us, Hopefully, we all work together in unison in order to serve God together. Whatever God has gifted us for, for his work to be done. Mm. 